Hello all, welcome back. We're going to finish up chapter six now. So the next topic in chapter six is writing a standard formation reaction. So we went over standard enthalpies of formation in part four. Now we're going to go into writing a standard formation reaction. So this notation here we saw that is the change in standard enthalpy. Now we saw standard enthalpy of the reaction and the standard enthalpy of formation. Standard enthalpy of formation was forming some specific molecule or compound from its original components or from its most simple components. So we saw some standard enthalpies of formation. This is back in part four. So on slide 14, we saw this table 6.4 again with various standard enthalpies of formation. And so that's that notation again with that F here for formation. Then the standard enthalpy of a reaction now denoted by Rxn for reaction, still with that standard notation. So that zero here or an O lowercase O, that means a standard value. Standard enthalpies of reaction aren't necessarily building up certain molecules or atoms from their original components. So instead, standard enthalpies of reaction can take reactants and products, and we can get a standard enthalpy of reaction from various products and reactants. For instance, for this reaction here, we could get a standard enthalpy of reaction, but it's clear here that this is not building up water or C6H4O2 from its original components here in this reaction. Instead, what we see is the components built up in these other three reactions and then these all total together to this total overall reaction with that standard enthalpy of reaction, again for this whole entire reaction. Now what we're adding to get up to that total overall reaction is, for example, hydrogen peroxide or H2O2 built up from its initial or simple components such as water and oxygen. Then we built up water here with hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. So the standard enthalpy of reaction for the overall reaction, again, isn't necessarily just building up water from its simple components, we can have other compounds and molecules present in this overall reaction and still calculate a standard enthalpy of reaction. Okay, so standard enthalpy of reaction, a little bit more complex than just the standard enthalpy of formation. Standard enthalpy of formation is just forming one individual molecule or atom. So coming back here, we can build up carbon monoxide from its simplest components, so carbon and O2. We can also build up carbon dioxide then from carbon monoxide and O2. Then adding these two together, we can find a standard enthalpy of reaction for this overall reaction. To get the standard enthalpy of reaction for the overall reaction, we do need to look at these individual steps that go into totaling up to that overall reaction. So this overall reaction is broken into two steps. In the first step, it converts one mole of graphite and one mole of oxygen gas to produce one mole of carbon monoxide. Then this carbon monoxide and this O2 then go on to form carbon dioxide. So in this first step, we can get a change in enthalpy. That standard change in enthalpy for the first step is 110.5 kilojoules, a negative 110.5 kilojoules. What does it mean if that negative sign is on the delta H? So a negative sign for that delta H means we have an exothermic reaction. That means that energy is released between the reactants and the products. So the reactants start out at some energy, some energy is released, then we end up at the energy of the products. And we can see that here. So these reactants are at a higher energy than these products, and so some energy was released, therefore corroborating that we know this is an exothermic reaction, also because of that negative sign for delta H. 
So at this point, we've gone from here to here. Now we can look at the second reaction that also has an associated change in enthalpy. That value is negative 283 kilojoules. So even though we didn't know graphite and O2 all the way down here to the final product of interest from the initial reactant of interest, we could break this reaction down into step one and step two. Then the total enthalpy change for this overall reaction is going to involve the change in enthalpy standard from step one plus the change in enthalpy standard for step two. So these two steps could be added together to then find the overall change in enthalpy from one mole of graphite and one mole of oxygen gas to produce one mole of carbon dioxide. So matching this reaction here. So this also builds on what we saw in part four on Hess's law. In Hess's law, we showed that reaction one or step one could be added to reaction two or step two to get our overall reaction. Whatever enthalpy change was involved in step one is additive to the enthalpy change in step two to then get our overall change in enthalpy for this overall reaction that is a result of adding step one to step two. To show this addition worked out, let's say we wanted to add these two together. We definitely have this reactant, so C in the form of graphite, this is just carbon in the form of graphite. We know carbon can also be in the form of a diamond, but carbon is much more stable as graphite. Then the other reactant to deal with is 1 half O2 plus CO plus another 1 half O2. Then the reactants here from the two reactions is CO gas. I should be putting in the physical states of matter here, just running out of some room, plus CO2 gas. How does this add up to this final reaction? Well, we see carbon monoxide shows up on both sides of the reaction, so we can cancel that out. Then 1 half O2 plus 1 half O2, that totals up to just 1 totals up to just one O2. So then we're left with carbon in the form of graphite, matches up with this. One mole of O2 gas, I should specify, is here. Those are our only two reactants now. This goes to our only product of carbon dioxide gas. So then we take the delta H associated with step one plus the delta H associated with step two. Then that equals our total delta H for this overall reaction. Let's try this practice problem. So write a balanced chemical equation, so balanced here, for the standard formation reaction of solid calcium oxide, or CaO, as this ionic formula. This is an ionic compound, right, because calcium is a metal and then oxygen is a nonmetal. For a quick review, calcium is an alkaline earth metal, right? So Ca2 plus, oxygen is 2 minus. To do the cross method here, we'd end up with Ca2O2. That simplifies then to just CaO as our name, calcium oxide. So to solve this practice problem, the standard formation reaction of a chemical compound has one mole of the compound as its only product. Then for the reactants, has only elements in their standard state. We are building up calcium oxide from its most simple components or from the elements that make up calcium oxide. So whenever we're writing out a standard formation reaction, we can follow these steps. Step one, identify the elements in the compound. Well, we did that on the last slide. So we definitely have calcium, two plus, oxygen would be two minus. These are the ionic forms of calcium and oxygen. What we want for these standard formation reactions is the non-ion forms of each element. We want the non-ion forms of each element. For all of our group one and group two metals, group one and group two metals, those are going to be a solid 
in their natural elemental state. Most other elements we see will also be solids. It turns out mercury is most stable as a liquid. So if we're building up something that contains mercury as an element, it's probably going to be composed from its liquid state. So group one and group two, we're gonna list those elements as solids. What about oxygen? Something hopefully that's coming to you is thinking about the Brinkelhoffs. If we are building up something that contains a Brinkelhoff element, then we have to denote that element in its diatomic Brinkelhoff state. So calcium, definitely one of the group one or group two metals, it's in group two. Calcium then we will denote as solid calcium as its simplest elemental form. Oxygen, however, is not going to be oxygen solid. Oxygen exists as a gas, importantly is one of the Brinkelhoffs. So oxygen in its simplest natural state is O2 diatomic oxygen as a gas. So again, watch out for the Brinkelhoffs. Then generally all of our group one and group two and most transition metals we're going to see as solids. Step number three, write and balance the formation reaction equation. From the setup of our problem, we're told we are forming solid calcium oxide. That means at least on the product side, we can write solid calcium oxide. The simplest natural state of calcium, like we just went through, is calcium solid. The simplest natural elemental state of oxygen is O2 as a gas. So this is one part of step three, then we will need to balance this. So calcium solid, diatomic oxygen gas forms solid calcium oxide. Then again, importantly, we need to balance this though. And it doesn't matter what order we put our reactants, so we can put oxygen before calcium or calcium before oxygen. Both ways of writing that is totally fine. So over here we have two oxygen atoms, here just one. We're gonna have to put a two right here. That means we have two calcium atoms. To balance this, we need to add a two right here. Now in step number three, this makes this step come out to this equation here. So this is our balanced formation reaction equation. We are not yet done though. We need to go on to step four. Step four, make sure the equation has only one mole of the product. For this to be a formation reaction, this is key. We can only be forming one mole of the product. So the standard formation reaction, this by definition produces, again, really importantly, just one mole of the product. So if necessary, we can divide the formation reaction through by the stoichiometric coefficient of the product. In this case, the coefficient of the product is two. To get rid of this two, but still have this be a balanced chemical reaction, we could divide all the molar coefficients by two. For oxygen, this is an implied one out front. So then one divided by two for the diatomic oxygen, Again, diatomic, that doesn't change. Diatomic oxygen has to be there. It's still a gas form too, so all we're doing is adjusting these molar coefficients so that we form one mole of the product. So then two here, we're gonna say two divided by two for solid calcium. Then two divided by two for solid calcium oxide. In this case, we'll have one half O2 gas plus just solid calcium now, two divided by two is one, then goes on to produce, again, just one mole of our product. So two divided by two is one, one mole of calcium oxide on the product side. This is the answer we are looking for. Is it balanced? Yes. To check this, we have one oxygen atom, right? So this is one half times two, so that's one on the reactant side then one oxygen on the product side, one calcium, one calcium. So this is still balanced because all we did was divide each molar coefficient 
by the same factor or two. So this was the standard formation reaction for calcium oxide. Again, watch out for the Brinkelhoffs and be sure you're familiar with what would be a solid and what would be a gas. Group one and group two and most transition metals we're going to list as solids. Now this next topic, calculating a molar heat of reaction from formation enthalpies. So to build up for this topic, let's talk about the change in enthalpy of a solution. This is denoted as delta H, then that subscript is for the solution. This enthalpy of solution is the heat generated or absorbed when a certain amount of solute dissolves in a certain amount of solvent. What's the most common solvent we've been working with so far? Well, we've done a lot with water as a solvent. So something being an aqueous solution, forming a solution and calculating the molarity. Generally, our solvent has been water. Now, there is some heat generated or absorbed when you dissolve a solid into water. We'll get into drawing Lewis dot structures in just a little bit later in the semester. This is our structure for water. We have one oxygen and two hydrogens. When these two atoms bond, so H plus O, when these bond, we're gonna have more negative charge near the oxygen. Why? Well, another concept we'll get to a little bit later, it's because oxygen is more electronegative. It wants more electrons around its atom. This causes this partial charge on oxygen to be slightly negative, then the partial charge on the two hydrogen atoms to be slightly positive. Don't worry about this too much yet. I just wanted to show you why we might see a change in enthalpy as we dissolve some solute into water molecules. So for instance, let's say we had lithium and chloride. This is an ionic compound. Lithium will form plus one ions. It's an alkali metal. Chlorine will form minus one anions. It's a halogen. When this ionic compound dissolves in water, the positively charged lithium cations are going to associate themselves closer to the negatively charged oxygen of water. Similarly, the anionic chloride ions will start to associate themselves closer to the partial positively charged hydrogens. So this is actually a pretty stable solution because this positive charge is stabilized by this partial negative charge. Then same thing for this positive charge and this negative charge. So from that information for lithium chloride, this is a negative delta H. That means that energy or heat is released because this is an exothermic process. For an exothermic process, the reactants start out at higher energy or enthalpy than the products. So some energy is released along the way, making the products have a lower energy. So for a lower energy or enthalpy for the products for this exothermic reaction, and we see that from the negative delta H, a lower energy or enthalpy means more stable. So when we dissolve lithium chloride into water, we're going to release some energy or some heat as we're mixing this solute with water as a solvent. This means that this solution is actually more stable than the original ionic compound and water molecule alone. So we dissolve lithium chloride into water. We're going to release some energy, leaving a more stable product where that product is lithium chloride ions dissolved in water. So this table 6.5 in your book is reporting the compound and then the delta H of solution in this unit that we've seen before or kilojoules per mole. How we actually calculate this amount of change in enthalpy for a solution is based on the enthalpy of the solution or the final state minus the enthalpy of the individual components or their initial state. So we know when we see that delta sign, it's enthalpy final minus enthalpy initial. So the final state is when we form the solution. 
the initial state is the individual lithium chloride plus the water on their own. So of those individual components. So it depends on what we dissolve into water. Sometimes we see that negative delta H, sometimes we see a positive delta H. It depends on the nature of the individual atoms that get dissolved into water. So the size of those atoms and the charge of those atoms. Lithium forms plus one, calcium forms two plus. Calcium two plus can actually form an interaction with negatively charged oxygen on one side of the ion and on another side. So it has the capacity to interact with two partially negatively charged oxygens in water. And that's because it's a two plus charge, whereas lithium is just a plus one charge. So don't worry too much about this. I just wanna show you the general structure for water, which we will get to, and just briefly why calcium two plus with chloride has a slightly more negative delta H compared to lithium chloride. Let's go through visually what it looks like to form a solution with sodium chloride in water. So in the first step, the ions in solid sodium chloride are separated into their gaseous Na plus and Cl minus ions. Why are they gaseous? Well, we're taking solid sodium chloride and not thinking about this yet into solution. We're just thinking about solid sodium chloride on its own, not yet in water. Okay, so we're talking about enthalpy of the individual components. So just sodium chloride right now. Without water around, this becomes Na plus and Cl minus as expected. When these can't be in aqueous form, they're technically as a gas. So again, they're not yet in water, but the solid still breaks apart into Na plus and Cl minus. It's not in aqueous solution yet because we're just focused on sodium chloride as an individual component, not yet in water. So this process is the lattice energy. By lattice, we mean that there's a lattice network of Na plus and Cl minus ions. So in solid sodium chloride, they form this lattice network where the Na plus and then Cl minus ions are in close proximity because opposite charges are attracted. So this process is the lattice energy of the compound. It's equal to 788 kilojoules per mole. So this is a positive value for kilojoules per mole. So this red is circling the final step. We just talked about step one. So taking the solid lattice of sodium chloride, breaking it apart into Na plus and Cl minus ions, not yet in water, so they're technically in a gaseous state. Then we're in step two. So we have those gaseous Na plus and Cl minus ions. So Na plus and Cl minus ions are now dissolved into water thereby hydrating those ions. Again, don't worry too much about what this hydration looks like on the molecular level. Just wanted to show you that this red and white, these are the water molecules. As you may be able to see, this Na plus is surrounded by the partially negatively charged red oxygens. Then the negatively charged chloride ion is surrounded by the positively charged, partially positively charged, hydrogen atoms in water. So this is what's meant by hydration. We are surrounding the Na plus and Cl minus ions by water molecules. So this process is the heat of hydration now technically, right? So we're hydrating those ions. It's equal to negative 784 kilojoules per mole. So now to find the heat of solution or the enthalpy of solution for this whole process, we had to go from step one where we took solid NaCl into its gaseous ions. Then in step two, we hydrated those ions. The total heat for forming a solution with sodium chloride is the sum of step one plus step two. So even though it took a lot of energy because we had that large delta H for this initial step one, this is a positive delta H 
What does a positive delta H mean? Is it exothermic or endothermic? So positive delta H is endothermic. What does it mean for an endothermic process? This endothermic reaction requires energy for the reaction to take place. So this is our reactant. It required a lot of energy to get up to this gaseous ions. And that makes sense because NaCl as a solid is fairly stable. So to break apart these ions is a highly endothermic reaction. Just based on this alone, you wouldn't expect this solution to be formed. What allows it to actually form is the fact that when we put those gaseous ions then into water, we hydrate them, then we do release energy in this now step two exothermic reaction. So again, in step two, we release negative 784 kilojoules per mole because this hydration step then releases energy. It is exothermic. Exothermic reactions lead to a more stable product because we have a lower energy in the end for exothermic reactions. Endothermic reactions, they require energy for the reaction to take place. Exothermic reactions release energy upon the completion of the reaction. So now adding step one to our value in step two, we are taking a highly endothermic process but then we're adding that to a highly exothermic process. In the end, we still have a slightly endothermic reaction, but not nearly as endothermic as this initial step one. So to write that out, if we have a positive delta H, we know that's endothermic. That means it requires energy absorption for the reaction to take place. That means the energy of the reactants is going to be lower than the energy of the products. So the reactants gained energy to then transform into the products. That leaves higher energy products. So again, that requires energy from the surroundings. Endothermic reactions may not happen if the surroundings can't supply that energy to the endothermic reaction. On the other hand, exothermic reactions have that negative delta H. They release energy over the process of the reaction. That means the energy of the reactants was higher than the energy of the products because the reactants then release some energy throughout the reaction, leaving lower energy products. Lower energy products are more stable products. Generally, reactions will take place until we reach some stable product. So exothermic reactions happen more easily because they don't require energy from some external or some surroundings. So from something external or some surroundings, however, endothermic reactions do. They require energy from their surroundings to take place. This is a small side detail that you don't need to worry about Exothermic reactions do require some initial small input of energy to get started in the first place, but then they release energy. This is a detail you would see more in Gen Chem 2. Here we just found the enthalpy of solution by taking step one plus step two to then get our enthalpy of solution. This is the same thing as thinking about it this way too, where the change of enthalpy of the solution is the enthalpy of the solution minus the enthalpy of the individual components. In this case, this is what was happening to the individual component of sodium chloride. Then in the end, we have the enthalpy of solution because those ions were then hydrated or they were surrounded by water molecules. We made the solution here in this last step. So step one plus step two, we get our last step here, and then this final value for the enthalpy of solution. Let's try this practice problem. So using the table of standard formation enthalpies, we want to calculate the reaction enthalpy of this reaction under standard conditions. We'll round our answer to the nearest kilojoule. So this is our reaction. It looks balanced. It doesn't hurt to check. So we have eight S's. 16 H's and eight O's. We have a gas, gas, solid, and liquid. 
This is a fairly complex overall reaction. From what we've been talking about, we need to find the individual steps that lead up to us finding this overall reaction. You need to find the reaction that's step one, step two, find those associated delta H's, then add these together for our overall reaction. So at this point, we need to know what is step one and what is step two, then their associated enthalpies of reaction. There's also not necessarily just two steps. There could be more than that. There could be less. There's not going to be less here, though, because this is a more complicated reaction that involves sulfur, oxygen, and this compound with sulfur and hydrogen. So this is definitely not just a one-step kind of reaction. So we can solve this problem by rewriting the reaction, again, as a sequence of standard formation reactions. Then if we need to, we can use Hess's law to either reverse some reaction, multiply the molar coefficients by some factor, divide the molar coefficients by some factor, then total up the enthalpies to get the enthalpy of the reaction in its standard value. That standard enthalpy of the reaction, again, it's composed of all of the individual standard enthalpies of formation for all the components that make up that whole reaction. So we need to find these standard enthalpies of formation for everything involved in our overall reaction. So using a table in Alex or a table in your textbook, we can find these different standard formation reactions and importantly, their associated standard enthalpies of formation values. Now in deciding which ones we need a standard formation reaction for, we need to consider what is already in its standard elemental state. How do we know if any of these are already in their standard state? So we can tell that something is already in its standard state if we have one of the Brinkelhoffs that is present, and if we have some element that's just listed on its own, so a non-bonded element. So sulfur on its own, this is already in its natural state. Oxygen as a diatomic, this is in its natural state. We do, though, need to figure out the enthalpies of formation, those reactions, for H2S and H2O. You would be provided with these sorts of reactions, so you don't need to write any of these down on your note card. You should be able to recognize, though, when we have something that's already in its standard state. Again, an element that's not bonded to any other elements or a Brinkelhoff that is in its diatomic form. The standard enthalpy of formation for these elements already in their standard state, these values are zero. So then we look for a table like this, find a reaction where H2S is there, it's being formed. How do we form H2S? Well, from diatomic hydrogen and sulfur. Then how do we form water? Well, we find this in a table. We see it's composed of H2 and O2. Bring us back to part four, so slide 15. This is this series of equations we saw on slide 15. So we have some reaction. We're going to find the standard enthalpy of the reaction using the molar coefficients of our products and the standard enthalpy of formation for our products. We're going to sum all of this then minus the molar coefficients for our reactants multiplied by their standard enthalpy of formation values. So we need to do products minus reactants, and we'll go through that example in our practice problem now. So how do we use this equation? Well, importantly, first, we need to figure out what was already in its standard state. Now we have this value for H2S and this value for forming water. That was an important first step. We do need to notice that this is a 1 8th as the molar coefficient. This is 1 half. If in our overall reaction we don't see 1 8th and 1 half, we need to multiply this reaction by some factor, then meaning we also need to multiply 
this standard enthalpy of formation value by that same factor. So we first identified these. Now we'll need to do some sort of a Hess's law kind of puzzle to then figure out what we're actually going to add together to get the standard enthalpy of the reaction. I also want to point out here that for these standard enthalpy of formation reactions, we importantly have just one mole of the product, right? So we practice doing that, and so we see that here. For these standard formation reactions, we should just see one mole of the product, and so these here we do. Now we did a Hess's Law problem in part four. This is building on Hess's Law. I've written our overall reaction right here. We need to match that and based on these standard formation reactions individually. So we have this one and this one. We need to eventually total these up to then total up to our overall reaction. Again, we may need to multiply these molar coefficients through by some factor. We may need to reverse the reaction. If so, we'll deal with that for their individual delta H values. For example, if we need to reverse this reaction, then that delta H of formation becomes plus 20.6. If we multiply these molar coefficients by two, then we take negative 20.6 times two. So this is where our puzzle skills come into play. How can we first set this one up to more so match our overall reaction? One thing I would notice right away is that H2S is on the reactant side for our overall reaction, but here for this reaction, it's on the product side. At minimum, we know we need to reverse this reaction. The two other components that we want to build up to make this overall reaction, I should also write out the ones that are already in their natural state. So technically we can write this one out just to have it visualized and the one for sulfur as well. At this point, I've taken this reaction and I've reversed it. Looking at this molar coefficient out front, I should also now think, okay, I should probably multiply this whole reaction through by a factor of eight. So this molar coefficient matches up with this molar coefficient. This physical state of matter here should be solid. So I just fixed that. So I've reversed this reaction and I've multiplied through by eight. So eight H2S, eight H2, and now just a one out front for sulfur. Based on what we did to this reaction, we're gonna need to do the same to the value for the delta H. We reversed the reaction, so we'll need to change the sign and we multiplied everything through by eight so we'll need to multiply that standard enthalpy of formation also by eight. At this point now, it's probably good to stop and see where we're at. I made another typo here. This should be an eight subscript right here. So eight right here too. So at this step, let's go ahead and compare this to our overall reaction. On the reactant side, 8H2S as a gas, 8H2S as a gas. There's no just H2 in our overall reaction, so we'll have to figure out how we can cancel that out eventually. Then S8 as a solid, that is right here. Now we need to figure out how we orient these other three reactions so that we have 4O2, 8H2O, and we cancel out the H2. Let's go ahead and deal with the O2 one. So we have O2 gas goes to O2 gas. The standard enthalpy of formation associated with this one is just zero. For practice, what would we do to make this one match our overall reaction? Well, we'd multiply everything by four. The standard enthalpy of formation value for this reaction is still going to be zero, right? Four times zero is zero. Let's see now, based on what we've done, how this matches up with our original reaction. Well, here's 4O2 on the reactant side. Here's 4O2 on the reactant side. We still need to get rid of this 8H2 and then this 4O2 gas, both on the product side. So let's keep going now. So we've used this one as well. 
for this reaction, should we reverse it or should we keep it as is? Well, H2O liquid is on the product side. H2O liquid is on the product side in our original reaction. So we don't need to reverse it, but we should multiply the molar coefficients through by it looks like a factor of eight. So we want this one to match up with what we see here. Let's multiply everything through by eight. Eight times one half, that is four O2 gas, then goes to eight H2O liquid. So now we have eight H2O liquid on the product side and eight H2O liquid here on the product side. Let's see what's left over. So from this one, we have eight H2 gas and four O2 gas. These are both on the reactant side. These two from earlier reactions are on the product side. So we will be able to cancel those out. So we've dealt with this one now as well. Do we need to do anything with the S8 solid goes to S8 solid? Well, we can technically write it in, but because one is on the reactant side and one is on the product side, then just as written, these two will cancel out with each other. We still have this S8 solid from this reaction, so that's gonna help us put that into our overall reaction. Now, to sum all these up, as we sum them up, let's go ahead and cancel what shows up on the reactant side and the product side. So for example, we're focused on this reaction, this one, this one, and this one. Let's look at the reactants right now. So 8H2S as a gas. The other reactant here, 4O2. Then technically we have 8H2 gas as a reactant here, but we also have 8H2 gas as a product here. So those are going to cancel out. Then we have another 4O2 on the reactant side, but we also have 4O2 here on the product side. So then this term cancels out with this term. The other reactant here, the last one, is S8 solid, this reactant will cancel out with the product here. So this also does not need to show up in our final reaction. Now let's take a look at the products that haven't been canceled out. That is S8 solid, and then the only one that remains is 8H2O liquid. So when we did all of this, that needs to match our overall reaction, and it does. Now, based on what we did to these reactions, we need to do the same for the enthalpy values. Did we reverse the reaction? Did we multiply something by eight? Whatever we did to those reactions, we need to do to the standard enthalpy of formation values. Then we will total up those to get the standard enthalpy of our reaction. So what did we do to this reaction? It's negative 20.6. To make this balance out to get to our overall reaction or add up to get to our overall reaction, we reversed the reaction and we multiplied it by 8. That means we need to take negative 20.6, reverse the sign, so positive 20.6, and multiply that by eight. That equals negative 164.8. This is technically in kilojoules. Technically step three here we did on this slide where we added all these together. So combining the reactants and the products of both parts gives us the net overall reaction that we want. Again, we don't really need to worry about oxygen. We did multiply everything by four, but the standard enthalpy of formation for this diatomic oxygen, it's already in its natural state. That value is just zero. So right now we're dealing with the reactant. So technically we took zero. Technically we multiplied it by four, but that is still zero. So we've dealt with our two reactants. What did we do to this equation? So for this product for water, we didn't reverse the reaction, we just multiplied everything through by eight. So we need to take this value here and multiply it by eight. 
So negative 285.8, we need to not reverse the sign, but we do need to multiply this through by eight. So that is negative 2,286.4 kilojoules. Then for our other product, so the S8, this standard enthalpy of formation is technically just zero. All right, so this value is just zero. We didn't multiply that by anything. We just kept it as zero. So for that product, that's just zero kilojoules. So now from all of our steps combined, we're taking this value and this value to then be the overall standard enthalpy for our reaction. I made a mistake here, sorry, this is negative 20.6. We reverse that and then we multiplied it by eight. That needs to be a positive 164.8 kilojoules. So now we have this step and this step, those will total together to give us our overall enthalpy, standard enthalpy for the overall reaction. So again, from Hess's law, we took all these different reactions, we added them together. By adding them together, that gave us our overall reaction. Then to find the overall standard enthalpy of the reaction, we add these standard enthalpy values together from all of our steps. So we need to consider this step plus this step because this one was just zero, this one was just zero. So what's the delta H for this step plus the delta H for this step? That will give us our final answer. So a positive 164.8 plus a negative 2,286.4 this is all in units of kilojoules. This number plus this number gets us about negative 2121.60 kilojoules. We were told to round this to the nearest kilojoule. So our final answer here, negative 2122 kilojoules. So nearest whole number. So no decimal point here. There is a similar practice problem in the main slide deck that I recommend, so that's example 6.9. Now before doing one more practice problem together, I want to go back to this equation that we originally saw in part 4. So again, the molar coefficient times the standard enthalpy of formation for all of our products added together minus the molar coefficient for all of our reactants times the standard enthalpy of formation for each of those respective reactants. Then this number minus this number can also give us the delta H for the reaction. So we practiced writing out that sequence of standard formation reactions. Did we reverse anything? Did we multiply through by some factor? Once we get really comfortable with that, we could just use this equation. So we can find the standard enthalpy of the entire reaction from the standard enthalpies of formation for each component. And when we use this equation, we don't have to write out the full sequence. Let me show you what this looks like and we'll solve it and get the same answer in case you prefer this method over writing out all the sequential steps. So we're gonna find the standard enthalpy of the reaction by looking at the products minus the reactants. Let's talk about what the products would be. We know one of those products was just sulfur. That's already in its natural elemental state, so that's just zero. What was the molar coefficient for S8? Well, technically just one. It doesn't really matter because we're just gonna multiply that by zero. So that was one product. We're going to add that to the values for the other product. The other product is a molar coefficient of eight and for water. What is the standard enthalpy of formation for water? That is negative 285.8. So the molar coefficient for water times negative 285.8. So our standard enthalpies of formation, then these molar coefficients. So one molar coefficient and eight molar coefficient. We would sum these together, then subtract doing the same thing for our reactants. So molar coefficient for H2S is eight, molar coefficient for oxygen is four. 
For oxygen, we know the standard enthalpy of formation is just zero. We would take zero times four, technically. So that's dealing with the oxygen. By the way, this again means summation. So we're adding the product and the product value together, but then subtracting that from the reactants. For the reactants, we also add this reactant value to our other reactant value. So there's a plus sign here. So molar coefficient of eight, and then this value is negative 20.6. So molar coefficient value of eight, then negative 20.6. So zero plus eight times negative 285.8, that's negative 2286.4. Then we subtract that from the values for the reactants. This is gonna be zero, eight times negative 20.6. That is negative 164.8. So we take negative 2286.4 minus a negative 164.8. So we end up adding those together from two negative signs. This number plus this number gets us negative 2121.6. We can't forget what unit we started with. That was kilojoules. If we were to round this to the nearest whole number, the nearest kilojoule, negative 21. Two, two. That number matches up with what we did by writing out all of those sequential steps. So I labeled these as our reactants and our products. For the sequential step method though, you would just add these two values together. If you wanted to use this equation now instead, it is really helpful to remember what are our reactants and what are our products. So this method is nice too, because we don't have to write out all those steps. We just need to be careful about the negative signs and those molar coefficients and understanding how to interpret this formula. So hopefully this makes sense. If you have any questions, as always, let me know. So that's this formula technically, but we just broke this down to actually interpret what each of these variables means. Let's do this one more practice problem together. So example 6.10 in your textbook. And it's in the main slide deck. So we have this reaction involving aluminum and iron three oxide. We're told this reaction is highly exothermic. This should tell us we should expect to see a negative delta H of reaction. Calculate the heat released in per gram of aluminum reacting with iron three oxide. We have the delta H of formation for iron liquid given in this many kilojoules per mole. So to solve this, the enthalpy of a reaction is the difference between the sum of the enthalpies of the products. So what we just looked at, so summation of products minus summation of reactants. Then the enthalpy of each species, reactants and products is given by the stoichiometric coefficient times the standard enthalpy of formation for that species. So like the practice problem we just did. So we were given the standard enthalpy of formation for liquid iron. We would need to look up the other values that we need to plug into this equation to solve for the standard enthalpy of the reaction. Again, you would be given the values you need to work with on an exam, for example. So we are given the standard enthalpy of formation for liquid iron. It's not zero because the standard elemental state of iron would actually be solid iron. So for an exam question, for example, you would be given all the standard enthalpies of formation for whatever you need. That would help tell us the standard enthalpies of formation for solid versus liquid iron. Is it a value of zero or is it a non-zero value? Again, you would be given these values to work with. Then we need to look up the value for aluminum oxide and the value for iron three oxide. Then for solid aluminum, that is in its natural elemental state. So that standard enthalpy of formation would be zero. Then once we look up the values for each of these, we're given this one, we need the molar coefficients in the balanced chemical reaction. So for products minus reactants, that is two times the 12.40 kilojoules. This is kilojoules per mole. Technically we're multiplying it by a factor of two moles because of the molar coefficient. 
So this product here, to the molar coefficient times that 12.40 kilojoules per mole. Then for Al2O3, that molar coefficient is one. We would need to look up the value in some sort of table or be given that value in a similar table like this one, where you have the reactant or product, then the standard enthalpy formation reaction, then the corresponding standard enthalpy of formation value in kilojoules per mole. So with a table like this, then this is one times the value for Al2O3 or negative 1,669.8 kilojoules per mole. So those are both of our products. For our reactants then, we would take two times the standard enthalpy of formation for solid aluminum. That happens to just be zero. So two times zero here. Then for our other reactant, that molar coefficient value is just one. Then we need the standard enthalpy of formation value for iron three oxide. We could look that up in a table or be given that. That is negative 822.2 kilojoules per mole. So this number plus two times this number, all together in parentheses, minus, this is just zero, then a negative 822.2 kilojoules per mole. So this comes out to negative 822.8 kilojoules per mole. Going back to the setup of the question, we want to calculate the heat released in a per gram basis of aluminum. So a per gram basis, we don't yet have that. We have this value on a per mole basis. How many moles of aluminum are in our balanced chemical reaction? Well, this is per two mole basis of solid aluminum. Therefore, we need to take this mole amount and divide it by two because in that balanced chemical reaction, this value corresponds to a per two mole basis of aluminum. If we were asked to do the same thing for iron three oxide, it would just already be on a per mole basis because this molar coefficient is just one. Same for aluminum oxide, that molar coefficient is just one. Then for liquid iron, this would also have to be divided by two because of that molar coefficient out front in this balanced chemical reaction. So this reflects a 2Al solid in the balanced chemical reaction. We don't want this for every two moles of solid aluminum. We want this for every one mole. So we need to take this amount and divide it by two. This then gives us an amount of kilojoules per one mole of aluminum. Again, we would need to do the same thing if we were asked about liquid iron because of that two out front. The number of kilojoules per mole we found is based on there being two moles of liquid iron in this balanced chemical reaction. That molar coefficient could be two, three, four, whatever it is. The number of kilojoules per mole we found is based on the molar coefficients in this balanced chemical reaction. So again, this many kilojoules per mole for our standard enthalpy of reaction is based on the molar coefficients of that balanced chemical reaction. That means this is based on two moles of aluminum. To get this on a per one mole of aluminum basis, we take this value, divide it by two. So we're gonna have this on a per mole basis. We are asked to solve for this on a per gram basis, however. So with that, we need the molar mass or the atomic mass of just aluminum. So negative 822.8 divided by two, that's negative 411.4 kilojoules per one mole of aluminum. Now using the atomic mass that is in units of grams per mole technically, or the same way to say it, one mole weighs 26.98 grams one mole of aluminum weighs this many grams. Then to cancel out moles and leave just grams, we need to orient it such that 26.98 grams of aluminum per mole of aluminum 
than moles and moles cancel out. We want just on a per one gram basis, so grams in our denominator, this number divided by this number, this is 15.25 kilojoules per gram. Now technically it's a negative sign for the kilojoules per gram, but based on how the question is worded, it's asking us already in terms of how much heat is released. If we saw a negative sign here, that would already imply that heat is being released by the system. Right, so heat being released, that's a negative sign. Heat being gained is a positive Q. So heat being released, it's already a negative sign. So then how the question is worded is how much heat is released we can just state that without the negative sign. And again, because heat is given off, we should have that negative sign there. If it's just listed as how much heat is released, then we don't have to say explicitly the negative sign. That was our last topic in chapter six now. As always, definitely let me know if you have any questions and I will talk to you next time for chapter seven. Hopefully talk to you sooner in office hours. So have an excellent rest of your day and I'll talk to you soon.